Next we have uh, Yuska Benjo, I don't need to tell you who it is, uh, who will give a talk about meta transfer uh, learning for factorizing representations. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about uh, what I'm really excited about. I haven't been excited about a new idea for a long time, uh, as much at least. And uh, I think uh, uh, this hands out, it could have an impact on many uh, concerning many deficiencies currently. And uh, it, it mixes ideas from meta learning, transfer learning, um, dealing with notions of how to modularize knowledge and resolving all of these things in one piece. So, as you know, deep learning has always been about really, really learning representations and a good representation. And the idea we had. Uh, for a long time was uh, we would have several levels of representation. The high levels of representation would correspond to um, sort of abstract concepts that um, allow us to really understand the world and explain things in the world. Um, and in particular, uh, the kinds of notions that we communicate with language uh, should be represented at that high level. So, um, Often, uh, language refers to concepts that have to do with causality, about objects, think about agents, think about actions, and so on. So, so part of what I'm trying to do here has to do with uh, how do we extend the ability of deep learning to discover causal variables. And we cover as well uh, their causal which is cause, which is effect, how they relate with each other. Well, how they relate with each other, we kind of already know. It's standard machine learning, right? You learn conditional distribution, joint distributions, but, but uh, which is cause and which is effect is, is a question that hasn't received that much attention yet in machine learning, uh, in the core of machine learning, and especially in deep learning. And, and, and the other, which seems orthogonal question that this talk is about, is uh, well, the notion of is an entanglement which has to do with discovering variables also has connotations with the problem of how to separate the knowledge we have into pieces that can be reused. After all, that was the initial idea about these entanglement factors of relation right? that by separating those factors, we can reuse them in new ways more easily than if they're mixed up in things like this. And this. But it's also true, not just of the variables, but how the joint distribution is represented. There's a possibility that people are standing there. So, any chance? Can they reproduce it? Oh, yeah. Why is it interesting to think about how knowledge can be reused? It's interesting for many things. It's interesting because, uh, as I'll try to convince you, it facilitates transfer learning when uh, we consider going from one distribution to a, a different one. Uh, it facilitates the adaptation, uh, robustness, changes in the data, and things like that, which, which really matter in time. Yeah. And this is also connected to questions uh, in learning theory. So learning theory, as we know it, has been focused on the IID scenario where we assume, the big, big assumption of learning theory is that we are assuming that the test data that we care about will come from the same distribution as the training data. And every, you know, who does real machine learning, like does experiments, knows that the test data doesn't come from the same distribution as the training data for all kinds of reasons. And if you're going to deploy, and typically when we run our experiments, we cheat and we, uh, for example, we'll shuffle all the data for testing, because that makes the test data come from the same distribution and correctly from the training data. Uh, how about we pull the uh, thing so? I don't know, maybe uh, there'll be more room for people. Open, if you can open that up um, without breaking anything. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, so that, that's, I think, another question which this work uh, touches on. <laughs> yeah, it's still some little fun. Bring some chairs. And, uh, and it touches uh, at least the, the questions about causality, uh, touch on the notion of common sense. Right? So if we think about the limitations, the limitations of current machine learning, uh, one of the big concerns is that current systems don't understand the world really in any way close to our current system. Uh, or even like a two year old. Is that you don't understand physics like uh, intuitive physics, like a world would, uh, intuitive psychology. Um, so maybe one of the missing ingredients is the ability for machines to understand causal relationships. Uh, and of course, they're you know we don't train them in data, diversity of views about the world, but like Sally would be part of it. Um, okay, I said these things. No, let me. Um, Say something more about the IID assumption. Um, if you think about the physics a little bit, um, how do uh, we or physicists make sense of data is very, very different from our training data? Like, how do we project ourselves into mental simulation of what would happen in the movie? Well, the way we do that is we, we have good ideas about the laws of physics, right? How do Things change in the weather, the physical state changes, and the laws of physics. And then uh, we can plug in initial conditions that are very different from the ones we know about, so that have maybe zero probability on Earth, but could potentially exist on another planet. And we crank, we handle them, and you know, we get observation. So, so this is something that's kind of missing right now in machine learning, this ability to take the knowledge we have and transport it to scenarios that are unlikely under the training distribution. But humans do it all the time. Counterfactuals are about imagining situations which have not happened, will not happen, but we pretend they could happen or they could have happened or it, uh, and we reuse the mechanisms that we learned in order to uh, figure out you know, what the outcomes would have been. Even language uses counterfactuals. Um, uh, semantics very often. So this notion of having mechanisms that we can to uh, understand and separate from each other and compose in order to explain the world um, is uh, is something, of course, that is very present in physics, but is very present in the thinking of somebody like Bernard Schaffer, who I've known for many decades and has been uh, spending the last decade working on causality. Uh, and I, I talked a lot to him, and I read his book. And, and one of the ingredients in his book that has influenced me the most is this idea of independent mechanisms. So, so, so it's not just that we have a bunch of modules that each capture different aspects of the world, and that they're going to be composed to explain the data, but it's also that each mechanism is independent in an information theoretical sense. One way to think about it is if you had parameters that describe each of these uh, mechanisms, um, they don't depend on each other. In other words, knowing how uh, 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 the, the parameters of one module doesn't give you information about the parameters of another module. And the flip side of that is that if somebody changes one of those modules, the other modules don't change. And this is crucial for machine learning. And this is the this is this is the thing that I've been thinking about, right? Can we exploit this notion of independent mechanism to build um, priors about the world, about data that we want agents to learn that will help these agents cope with changes in distribution? And so if we want to cope with changes in distribution, with multiplicities, with changes in those mechanisms. We're going to need to make assumptions, right? The old um, assumption that the test data is from the same distribution of training data isn't valid anymore. And we need theories to deal with that. And those theories are going to have to rely on assumptions, right? Otherwise, the new distribution could be anything, and there's no reason to believe that you'll get any kind of generalization. 
So we need to make some sort of uh, fairly broad assumptions that hopefully work well in the real world. And the assumption that I'm proposing in this work is that there, the changes that are going to happen most of the time involve very few mechanisms. Okay, and we're gonna explain that a bit more. Oh, and, 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 and why is that a reasonable assumption? Well, <laughs> think about a world populated by agents, you and I, right? Agents cannot change the world in arbitrary ways because they have limited temporal and, and spatial extent. Like, I can move the things around me. It's hard for me to move the sun. It's hard for me to uh, change your brain. Oh, that's exactly what right now uh, but you know there's there's a limit to how many things i can think of once at once and so the world tends to change in the sparse ways but when i say sparse i have to also say what measure and what space right and so the right space for thinking about sparsity of changes in distribution isn't like pixel space it's the space of these high-level causal variables, the space of these uh, putative mechanisms which uh, help us explain how the world works. Okay, this is really the heart of my talk that I'm really explaining today and now, and uh, then we're going to go a little bit deeper to, to give some meat around this. But that's the idea. Um, another really, really central idea in this work is that if we, if we buy this assumption, and machine learning, by the way, is all about assumptions about the world, right? There's the no free lunch theorem says there is no machine learning algorithm that doesn't do any assumption, doesn't make any assumption, okay? Um, we'd like to have assumptions that are as general and broad as possible and that work well in this universe, in this planet, um, in, for many, many tasks. So, whereas classical machine learning has been about assumptions about the distribution of the data, here we're talking about assumptions about how the data distribution changes um, due to whatever. Uh, uh, could be that there are non stationarities well, what, where do the non stationarities come from? Um, there are non stationarities because agents intervene in the world, as I said earlier. It could also be Epistemological uh, changes, like because I discovered the world, um, my my mental understanding of the world changes. And, you know, I visit new rooms in the video game. So I, uh, uh, there are changes in the distribution as I encounter new things. You go to a new country, you learn a new language, uh, the distribution of things you're you're seeing changes, right? But those changes are small in the right space of representation. If you go to a new country, everything you know about the world uh, mostly stays the same. Now you have this sort of new traditional knowledge about uh, the culture and the language of, of that people. Okay, oh wait, oh wait. So, so, so now I'm going to explain that with that assumption about changes in distribution, there's a, there's a good consequence is that it leads to smaller sample complexity when adapting to that change in distribution. So you have, say, a learner that has seen data from a distribution, then the world changes, new distribution, but it's, it's a small change in the right representational space. And if the learner adopts this uh, assumption and, and has the right representational space, then the learner will benefit by requiring less data to, to lead to good generalization. So, so that's a claim, and then I'll argue that I be in some special cases why it's obviously true, and then uh, we'll go about uh, applying these ideas in the context of Kazal. But before, uh, oh, I have a picture here, it's really straight. So imagine that you know you have some model of the world and you've divided the knowledge about the world in pieces, and those pieces maybe interact with each other in some ways. This is what the graph is meant to be. Um, and then the distribution changes, and one of the pieces changes. You observe things uh, that have different characteristics. Um, in the right space of representation, which is that this graph is illustrated, the change is very local and limited. 
but in the observed space, like pixel space, it might be a huge change. So here, the, the analogy I have is, uh, right now my eyes are open, I see all of you, or most of you, and then I close my eyes. Pixel-wise, it's a completely different story. But really, in the light, high-level representation space, only one thing changed, I close my eyes. And hence, eyes, and uh, you know, being open or closed, is a really, really useful high-level variable for me to model the world. Because I can explain something that looks very drastic with one bit. So these are the kind of high-level variables we want to put in the graph. Because it's going to localize the change, and it's going to allow me to quickly adapt to that change. I don't need to relearn a new distribution, really. I just need to learn a parameter that says the probability of my eyes being closed suddenly changed. So before I go deeper, I'd like to give you a chance to maybe ask questions or comment, and we'll have time at the end as well. But, but I want to make a pause here because I've introduced like really the basic ideas, and if, if people have comments or questions, I know there are a lot of people, so it might be difficult, but I just want to give you a chance to react. Yes. So you're assuming they have notion of time now. Yes. Time. Yes. So in the distribution world. Yes. Yeah, so this, so so variables can have usually a terminal extent, and uh, and so your model of the world, like my internal model of the world, includes time. I'm thinking about things that will happen in the future, things that happened in the past. The events are located in time. Um, so yeah, time is part of what we're modeling. So, so there's like causal factors, and uh, you said in the beginning also disentangling factor. Do you think it's possible that these could be actually not the same amount? And well, so causal factors, disentangling factors. So, so we're trying to separate out the knowledge of pieces, and, uh, and 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 if we want to associate like numbers of those pieces, we think about variables. Um, I believe that many of these variables have to do with causal factors. So what is a causal factor? It's something that is either a cause or an effect in a cause-effect relationship. Uh, not every number we manipulate naturally get the status of being causal variables. Um, pixels in an image are not really proper causal variables unless it, you think of the whole image as being like the effect of some process. Uh, but like individual pixels really doesn't make much sense to talk of them as causal variables. So, so there are quantities that we make up or uh, um, that maybe even exist if you think platonically uh, that deserve to be called causal variables. And uh, maybe not all of the quantities that we manipulate would have that status. For example, the sort of quantities we use for doing inference about causal variables uh, you might not want to talk about them as causal variables, but, but just uh, pieces of the computation. So procedures would be decomposed into pieces, um, and it's a different type of variables. Yes? Yeah, so I was just wondering, what's the notion of causality you are uh, using in this context? Oh, I'll get back to that. Um, so the notion of causality I'm talking about um, has to do with um, the uh, basically the same definition as we find in video pros. So in other words, uh, what happens if an agent makes an intervention uh, on one of these variables? So if somebody were to change one of these variables, what would be the effect? And now, knowing whether A is cause of B or B is cause of A will lead to a different answer. So the, the, the intervention will have a different consequence depending on uh, which is cause and which is effect. That's my definition. So, if you were talking about the physical rules, well, yeah. is the goal for the model to learn those rules? Or uh, is it an input? To some extent, yes. Or is it an input of some well, uh, so I, I'm, uh, I've always been like a. Uh, somebody who believes that we want to do machine learning research that uh, tries to be as tabular around as possible. When you deploy an application, you want to use as much knowledge as you can, 
when you do research, that's going to have a big impact on me using as little knowledge as possible. That's my you know, approach to doing things. And it's simply because of the impact, right? So if I discover how an agent can figure out the physics, it's much more powerful than if I have to program the agent. And, and, but, you know, if you have to build a robot, please use the physics if you can, right? I'm not against that, of course. Thank you. The, the, the what? The nodes? They could be different things. Yeah, I mean, you could have all kinds of interpretations. So they, you can think of variables or computations, um, depending on the use of these ideas. But uh, the main point is that the knowledge is represented uh, as the combination of these pieces, and those pieces can interact. In, in the case that I'm going to explore now, uh, the nodes are actually random variables, and the arrows represent causal dependencies. Yeah, that's a question from Devin. Uh, I'm not sure I understand it, but I'll read it. All right. So, isn't there a sort of bias in this picture in terms of how humans perceive the world? I of course, can drastically change our visual experience. Yeah. But the joint distribution of our experiences in a lot of other representation, the consequence of us being exposed to richer data and not specifically a mechanism for learning. I didn't understand. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> All right. I'm not going Later. Okay, let me move on. <laughs> Thanks for your questions. Okay. So, let's actually consider the case where these are variables, and this is a directed graphical model. Um, and the intervention, so, so, so now the parameterization is going to be so I'm going to consider a special case now, and mostly for the rest of the talk. The parameterization is going to be probability of one variable given its parents. We're going to have separate parameters for each of these conditional probability distributions. And uh, we're going to consider the case where um, one or a small set of uh, these conditionals have changed. Um, and then I have this really uh, Theorem that says that uh, under these assumptions, uh, the gradient on the other modules, the ones that didn't change, will be zero. Okay, that's like a very, very simple consequence of A, assuming that we've already learned well that, and B, the change is localized. So now, because the joint decomposes into product of the conditional, it's very trivial that the gradient will be probably zero for the others. Okay, um, the, so, so here's like a special case. You consider two variables, A and B, and there's a joint, um, which can be factored into the marginal times, uh, one marginal times a condition, or the other way around. One of the directions corresponds to the correct causal graph, so say A is complete. And now if we change the cause A, so we change its marginal um, the condition doesn't change. And so when I see the new distribution, under the new distribution, uh, the uh, gradient on my parameterized conditional uh, will be approximately zero. So that's just as an illustration of what I mean in the very simple theorem. What it means, though, is of all the parameters I have, fewer those that correspond to the modified modules, because the learner doesn't know that, uh, fewer of those modules will need to be adapted. I mean, the others will get a gradient because you don't know which module has changed. But the ones that have changed will have like a significant gradient. The others will get a gradient which in average is zero. So there will still be some noise in the gradient. But only the modules that have changed will, uh, will have a significant gradient. And, and, and so in terms of the effective number of degrees of freedom that need to be adapted 
for that change. Uh, it will be small. But that's if we have decomposed the joint in the correct way, right? If we have decomposed it the wrong way, we might not benefit from this. Okay, so if we have the wrong factorization, give B times P of A. Now what happens is if we change P of A in the real world, our uh, estimated P of B and our estimated P of A and B, both will need to change to deal with the change in P of A. This is just a consequence of Bayes' theorem that uh, you, write, you write these in terms of P of A and P of um, B given A, you see that by change P of A, then both P of B and P of A given B have changed. And I'm, I'm now going to make another claim that this sort of situation that now I was creating with these conditionals uh, and the case where I don't have the right factorization of knowledge, every parameter is going to need to change in order to deal with the change. And I'm claiming that this is almost the normal in standard neural nets. That when you have a transfer scenario, when you have a domain change, when you consider probably uh, continual learning, catastrophic forgetting, and all these scenarios where the solutions change, every parameter in the neural net sort of naturally wants to participate in minimizing the error. And so um, you will, you will not have this fast adaptation that, I'm, that I've been talking about that would come out of having the right real head architecture that somehow fits well the underlying structure of the, the, the causal uh, relationships. Okay, and so uh, I, 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 my intuition is that making progress on this issue of modularizing knowledge could help us deal with things like catastrophic forgetting or transfer difficulty with continual learning and adaptation. Many things that really matter in, in uh, applications of machine learning and where we see machine learning systems break down when you show them examples that are somewhat unlike the training data but for a human, it's obvious what the answer should be. So we can test, we can test this idea that when you have the right factorization of knowledge here, the right factorization, of the learning curve, the, the rate of adaptation, the way that the learner adapts, how fast it, how many examples it needs to get a good performance, is going to be very different from if you have the wrong factorization. So we just did that where we consider two hypotheses, uh, one to model, one that um, factorizes with uh, A being the cause of B and the other is B being the cause of A. It's just they're both representing the same joint distribution, but with a different way of factorizing the joint, right? Uh, if you if you just consider training data and training distribution, both models behave exactly the same. But when you consider the scenario where you train them, and then you consider a modified uh, stream of data, and you allow the learner to adapt by online to the Gasegrian descent. Um, you see that the one that responds to the correct factorization, the one that matches the underlying causal structure, adapts much faster. So on the y axis is the log magnitude on a large test set from the modified stream. And you're seeing on the X axis the number of examples of, of the of the new distribution. So after 20 examples, yeah, it's already adapted reasonably well. Uh, and after hundred or a few hundreds of examples, both models do about the same. In fact, as I said earlier, if you have enough data, it doesn't matter what the factorization is. And so the two curves will converge to the same. But initially, when the number of examples is small, we see that the model that has the right factorization um, really uh, shines compared to the model that has the wrong one. Yeah. How robust is this graph to test isolation rules? 
I think it's pretty robust. We've tried this in many other settings and I don't think it's uh, an issue. But it's a good question. Um, this is related to um, work that has been done by um, Karen students and Karen and, and uh, Dina Badanao, who talked about this, I think, in, a, in a, another tea talk. Um, the question of systematic generalization. So, this is something that comes up in linguistics, and uh, humans have an ability to generalize out of the train distribution, in particular, to recombine linguistic concepts that they have seen in the training data. Like, you can, you can teach new words, new verbs to a human, and uh, they'll be able to naturally generalize to combinations of these that they have never seen before, and that they have zero probability in the training distribution. Whereas, um, different neural net architectures will behave very differently with respect to this. Some of the architectures they considered in this paper basically fails to do this systematic generalization, whereas some architectures did very well. But unfortunately, both of the different types of architectures um, did about the same on the training distribution. So just looking at test error doesn't always tell you what the right modularization of knowledge is, because the test distribution is from the same distribution as the training set. The same test set is from the same thing. Okay. So, uh, so, so what we propose to do in this paper, um, we could just do model selection, right? We could say change the distribution, see how different models perform, and pick the one that uh, adapts faster, and we can create some objective that measures how fast the curve rises, like some sort of area under the curve or whatever, or get an error, right? So we could do model selection, but uh, well, if you're doing model selection, really you're optimizing something. So uh, we might as well think of this as we are now defining a new objective function which is how fast you adapt to changes in distribution. Okay, so that's the, that's the practical message of this work, that we would like to define new types of objective functions that make sense when a learner is faced with changes in distribution. And the objective is to maximize the speed at which the learner adapts and gets good results, right, um, to new distribution. And it's different. It looks like it's almost the same as what we've been doing before, but it's not, right? It's not, and I gave you an example of that it's not, but when I, I showed that uh, on the training distribution, say the two models behave the same, but on the modified distribution, one of them adapts faster. And if I give them enough data of the modified distribution, they both behave the same again. So there's something special that happens in the early stages of learning where there's a lot of signal about what is the right way of factorizing knowledge. So this is fundamentally different from what we usually do when we say just optimize generalization error or optimize training error. This is the third thing, which is optimize speed of adaptation to changes in distribution. Yeah. So the changes in distribution with respect to each step, because the test is coming from the same distribution as the training set. So how can we measure this generalization, this new notion of generalization? So yeah, you're asking a really good question. Like, where are these changes in distribution coming from? Okay, so when we do scientific experiments that we control completely, of course we can engineer changes in distribution just like we did in this one. Um, but that's not very interesting. We really want to do, and we haven't done that yet. And, you know, we need to think about, okay, so the more realistic scenarios where this would apply. Um, I, I, I think uh, there already are scenarios that people are learning are studying, like transfer learning scenarios, multitask learning scenarios. 
Um, I think that uh, education is a good course of learning where even though it may look like there's only one distribution, the fact that the agent is writing through it and it's freezing its scope of what it knows about, uh, or the presence of other agents changing things in the environment could lead to these changes in distribution. But I don't I, I don't have like a completely clear answer to your question. And I think this is something that will need work in many different areas to see how this, this idea can be applied in practice. What about clustering for a curriculum? So you put um, yeah. examples of the same class together and then make the make the algorithm train on very similar examples successively. So you always get a shift in distribution. Yeah. Whereas it sees the same classes all the time. So I think continual learning scenarios are good cases. So people who are thinking about instead of shuffling all the data one uh, homogeneous mass, which is the normal way to do things, because of course you get better optimization. But it's cheating because the next thing that has become uh, could be from a slightly different distribution. So we should not destroy the uh, original data uh, non stationarity. We should exploit it. So we've been used to kind of try to destroy that information, but we shouldn't. And now, in different learning uh, scenarios and, and situations, I guess that there will be different needs for that. If, if the distribution that the agents are seeing are really very, very stable, then probably this is not going to help much. Um, but maybe we could even think about agents that purposely change things in the world to create changes in distribution. And I think humans do that, babies in particular, uh, uh, in order to discover things. So when we in the world, when we do experiments, which is also what scientists do, I think we are after um, creating sort of perturbations uh, distribution purposely to get at the sort of structural information that explains the world better. Okay. So, um, the things that I would like to optimize with this objective, um, there are at least two things that we have been considering. Um, one is the definition of what the causal variables are, because as I said, in the real world, you're going to get those pixels or low level sensory data, and they are not the variables in which it makes sense to talk about cause and effect. So, yeah, deep learning is about essentially learning the encoder uh, that maps the low level data to cause variables or high variables. So we want to learn that habit. And having the data map in that space, we want to know how they're related to each other causally. And so we want to learn the causal graph. So the graph here isn't the distribution, it's just the fact that it's a you know a discrete entity that says A is a cause of B, uh, C is a cause of B, and whatever. So there's a graph, and so that's a discrete uh, thing that we like. Okay, so so now I'm going to go a little bit uh, quickly on experiments we did um, on this very very simple, probably the simplest scenario at all, where you only have two variables that I mentioned before, and you have two models, one that factorizes the joint one way, and one that factorizes the other way. And now uh, we have to be concrete about deciding a uh, quantity that's going to capture this notion of how fast the learner adapts. So what we've chosen in those experiments is um, sort of the accumulated likelihood as the learner changes. So this is the probability that the model that they say is a cause of these in effect gives to uh, search data A B. Uh, uh, at time t uh, with parameters theta t, where theta t gets updated after each example. So we are saying the online setting and uh, the overall length we are getting first t examples is brought up of the likelihood. So that's the usual thing. The only difference for the usual likelihood is remember the parameters keep changing. Okay. So so the parameters are going to be learned as usual by say SGT or something. 
whatever you want. Now, I'm not online mechanism where you look at the past data, I don't care. But the parameters are changing. So this is the annotation process. Um, but we're going to define this objective function R, which really is a, a meta learning objective, right? It's not an objective for learning the parameters, it's an objective for figuring out what the variables should be and whether I should believe that A is a cause of B or B is a cause of A. So we're going to measure that these two, uh, uh, which we call them regress, kind of regress, uh, minus log of that would be sort of regret. Um, and we're going to measure the funny on top, which is sort of the, the, the regret of the mixture, a special kind of mixture between the two hypotheses. So, so when we can think about it, from a meta learning point of view, I get one episode. This is this is as the um, as the learning adapts to the distribution. Okay, so this is you know, the second phase of training. We've already pre-trained. Now I get some new data, uh, and I, I see capital T examples. So, so this whole thing is going to be a measure of how well one of the discrete hypotheses uh, does on this episode, which is one meta example, but we're going to do this over and over. And for each meta example, which is one of the adaptation episodes, we want to we want to measure how well we're doing. So we introduce this uh, gamma parameter, which is going to measure our belief about which hypothesis is right or wrong. And we want to make small changes on this gamma so that will converge to the correct belief. Right? And so we take that belief gamma, which is a real number, which is sigmoid. And then uh, we use a sigmoid to give different weights to these two things. It's like if we had a mixture model for uh, either we explain the data with this model or we explain that episode with that model. And we take the log and minus because we want to minimize, and that's our objective. Um, we can look at the gradient of that objective with respect to the meta graph. Now, gamma is this meta parameter which controls our belief of uh, which hypothesis is correct. And uh, we can calculate it. Uh, we can see that it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it wants to push the probability sigma of gamma giving to um, the A causes B parameters towards the sort of posterior probability that, that this particular episode gives us about the hypothesis A uh, is cause of B. Uh, another derivation uh, says that it wants to increase uh, if uh, A causes B is larger, I mean, uh, it gets more uh, down faster, basically. Than that. So, in proportion to the difference, the log of the line piece will adapt to the delta here, controls how much we change the gamma. So, we'll push up and then A causes B adapts faster, we'll push down in the other case. So these are just the gradients. And now there's a more interesting theorem that says that if we do stochastic gradient descent on this meta parameter using this objective, um, so we're now minimizing the expected value of this uh, meta, uh, this uh, this regret, this meta objective, uh, and we do SGD on it because we only get one. But anyway, at the end, if we converge. If this SGD converges, so we're going to have decreasing learning rates and so on, then you converge to the right thing. Um, that's, that's what you're showing. Um, and then we have a bunch of experiments to validate um, these ideas to some extent, still in the very simple variables. Uh, I won't go through all the details of these experiments. Um, they all correspond to different parameterizations of uh, the, the conditionals, the marginals, or the joints. Um, the simplest experiments are with the tabular parameterization. So it's just that A and B are discrete, and uh, we have a table for P of A and a table for P of A, or a table for P of B given A, and so on. And we use the category descent on, the, on, the, on these parameters. Uh, and now, uh, all the graphs I'm going to show you have on the x-axis the number of episodes. They're like the meta examples. Uh, each of these episodes means we do one update of the gamma or the whatever quantity that is 
uh, being optimized with respect to the uh, meta objective of fast speed of adaptation. And then on the y axis, we have uh, the meta parameter basically. Uh, so here we know that the right answer is one uh, for sigma of gamma. And uh, we should see the conversion of one. And we see that it converges at different rates depending on different conditions. So, for example, what we find here, which is really interesting, is that capital N is the number of values that those discrete variables have. So, why is that interesting? So, if you have two variables, A and B, um, the tabular representation will be N squared parameters for the conditional and N parameters for the marginal, right? And uh, in the uh, nice case where the intervention is on the cause, uh, we only need to change the marginal, which has n degrees of freedom. And we don't need to change the conditional, which has n squared parameters. That's if you have the right model. If when you have the wrong model, as I said earlier, everything is mixed. And so you've got to change n squared parameters, order of n squared parameters. And so that comes up in the speed of adaptation. The, so now we see this really funny thing, right? So the n is large. If you have too many parameters, uh, you're going to be more fitting because you don't have a lot of data. Each of these episodes is like five or ten, five or ten examples. And so when you have the overlay situation where the new distribution, you know, you don't have enough data for it, that's the scenario where you get the most signal about what the correct model is. You can see that with n equal 100, it converges to uh, the correct answer, like which, which is cause, which is effect, is extremely fast compared to the case where you have only 10 parameters. I mean, and, and values, so you've got order of n squared um, 100 parameters. So, so this is cool, right, because um, the things that are usually bad for machine learning, like not enough data, too many parameters, um, changes in distribution, all of these things become good from the point of view of figuring out what's the right modularization of knowledge. Right? So the things that are a hindrance usually in machine learning become a training signal for these meta parameters, which tell us about things like what is the underlying uh, uh, we, a good way of representing the knowledge, what are the right variables, which one is cause, which one is effect. Now, these are toy experiments, and I'm claiming these things, but we'll have to verify over the long run. But this, this is my intuition for what is going on. So we've done many more experiments uh, where the conditionals could be MLPs, and again, we see the same kind of thing that the uh, uh, we can we can train these things, um, and it, it's uh, working also for linear Gaussian conditionals. Um, it's working for nonlinear multimodal distribution, where the conditional distribution is a spline. Um, and up to now, I've only shown the case where the variables A and B were fully observed, but we've also run experiments where um, you don't observe A and B. I have a better picture. No. Uh, you don't observe A and B. You, uh, you observe X and Y. And X and Y are being be obtained by transformation A. So, you know, the, the, the ground truth A and B are probably the But there is some transformation here, which is that. Uh, Linear transformation are in fact a rotation because that's all that matters in 2D. And so the new joint distribution will look like this. So this is the joint distribution in the original space, A is in the B. Um, in the rotated space, you can see that the relationship is now going to be murky if you just look at X and Y. There's no clear cause and effect. And but uh, if we go to the right end order, it will lead to fast adaptation. If we figure out the right causal relationships in the transform space, you and So now we're going to learn the joint in the UV space, and we're going to learn the transformation that the encoder has to do in order to lead to fast adaptation. So we're jointly learning this really simple case two parameters one for the encoder, which is rotation, 
and one for the um, causal direction. And so we see both nerves converging um, at a reasonable pace. Um, so most of that is in an archive paper, which is online since uh, I guess the ACML deadline. And uh, more recently, we've been doing a few things. So maybe the most pressing is does this even work with more than two variables? So we've experimented with that. Uh, we also need to generalize the objective function uh, formulation. Uh, so the, the generalization of what I explained before, when you have not just two hypotheses, but a whole set of graphs as potential hypotheses. Now you've got an exponential number of hypotheses. Um, it's going to be that you take the minus one of the second value over your belief of what is the right graph. So if you remember the, 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 the two variable case, when we interpret it is, uh, this is just, you know, the linear combination of the, the likelihoods for the, each of the hypotheses weighted by the belief that, you know, this one is the correct one. So we can do the same thing. It's an expected value of the per variable uh, with red. So this is the same kind of thing, uh, but now we have a graph. So, um, uh, for for each of those uh, um, uh, graph hypotheses, there's going to be a uh, part of the conditionals. If she does a missing I, uh, there's, uh, there's a missing product here of all the variables. Okay. Um, so we're going to take those line views for each graph hypothesis. So each is going to be a joint. And then uh, we're going to take the expectation of all the graphs. And, and the expectation is with respect to our belief about which graph is correct. Um, oh, yeah, okay, I get it. No, this is correct. Um, there was no mistake. Here's the missing equation. So, uh, so the likelihood for the whole graph is going to be the product of the likelihood over each conditional, each node. And that's what we take the expectation for the belief. And the beliefs control who is signed of who in the graph. So what, what are the inputs? You can think of each of these conditionals as a neural net. This is actually uh, how we bring it. Uh, so each neural net outputs the probability distribution for one variable, given other variables that are considered to be its parents according to the current hypotheses. Um, and uh, yeah, that's and for the end. Then there's a nice theory that says that. This thing, the objective we want, we can rewrite it in a way that's going to be more efficient statistically to estimate by sampling, where um, the expectation is that we can move all graphs uh, uh, jointly is going to be uh, for each variable over the choices of what are the inputs. Uh, what are the causal variables for each uh, of those nodes? So we can decouple all of those. For each conditional, we want to know uh, which of the other variables are going to be the causal parents. And we can sample these choices independently for each conditional and still get uh, a good estimator. Yeah. This is the aspect that you talked about earlier of the parameters so there's no, there's nothing explicit about that assumption in what we are optimizing. But if there is no sparsity in the change, then there will be no, no signal. Right. So in other words, all of the models. So the, the, the assumption is not something we actually use in the algorithm. It's it's robust to how much that assumption is verified. But the more the assumption for example, if the change is focused on one variable, then there will be a stronger signal than if it's all over the place. Is that clear? Yeah, it just seems like you could imagine moving on with the Yes. So, for example, in fact, uh, in fact, doing in the multivariable case, um, 
and we're starting to do is uh, trying to do inference over which variable was incomplete. So when you know which variable was incomplete, you can do updates to parameters that end up leading to much more stable convergence. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think this is uh, this is something uh, that needs a lot more uh, exploration. Um, we've considered the case where the learner is completely agnostic about the change, but it makes sense given the hypothesis that the learner would go one step further and say, well, uh, maybe I can guess which variable will change. And there's a very strong signal about that. Yeah, which of the conditionals uh, got a light year which was much worse than what it used to get in the pathway? So if there's a variable that you don't predict well, well, it's probably the variable that has changed. So, you know, there's like easy information there that we should be able to use. Uh, so we've experimented with different uh, number of variables and graphs and just verifying that some of the basic themes of uh, of causality that people study uh, can be recovered uh, by these techniques. Um, so I would like to use, um, I guess it's already 11.30, but I would like to use a little bit of time, if you're okay, to connect that with other things that I've been working on um, that concern other hypotheses about the uh, joint distribution between the latent variables and, and uh, how we can uh, do a better job of um, putting pressure on the learner to discover the right uh, high level variables. And those high level variables have to do with something that I think has been one of the uh, weaknesses of deep learning up to now, which is what the psychologists call the system types of cognition. So system one is things that deep learning does well, basically right now, uh, which for humans would be tweeted in the past, conscious, not linguistic, and you can do very quickly and accurately. Um, whereas system two stuff is what we usually consider like reasoning, everything is conscious, sequential, it's approximate, and we know that our simple rules explain the world are not perfect, um, but it can allow us to do really cool things like counterfactuals and uh, you know, if scenarios. And that's very close to what the classical AI I was trying to do. And so I think that making progress on these higher level variables and their relationships touches on the question of what we should do to better deal with these problems. Yes, Pascal. I just want to mention, but I think that's using your list discrete. Um, well, it's usually thought of as discrete, but uh, I actually think that uh, the high level, we also have a lot of continuous variables. So think about geometry. Think about shapes of things. These are can be very high level things that I, I visualize things. I'm, I'm a visual person and I see continuous variables all the time in my mind, not just discrete ones. Um, okay, so the, 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 the consciousness prior, uh, which I introduced a year and a half ago, it can be in the context of everything I've said today, let me uh, put it this way. In the context of everything I've said uh, today, amounts to simply saying that the joint distribution between the high level variables is a sparse. Factor graph. So the factor graph is a way to represent joint distributions in which we separate the joint into a product of little potentials, little functions. Each of these functions only need to touch uh, a subset of variables. And if it's sparse, it means that subset is small. And one way to understand what that means is think about rules in classical AI, rules and facts, like you know, classical stuff, right? That all of you never take courses of except if you are my age or something. Uh, basically, each of these rules is about two, three, four, five things. Think of each of these rules as a constraint that says, you know, these configurations of variables are have a high probability, and other configurations that contradict the rule have a low probability. And so that you can think of as a, 
uh, the potential of gaining a factor graph formulation. In fact, it's not something I'm making up. It's, it's been studied by a lot of people already. The probability formulation of our rule basis. Uh, and so, uh, so this is an extra assumption. Um, and the connection to consciousness is simply that the things that come to our consciousness are uh, involving very few variables at a time. And so it, it would be one of these factors or a couple of these factors that interact uh, that we are conscious of at a particular time that we move on to another. Um, so, so, you know, in order to implement that, we would need something like an attention mechanism that can select a subset of variables that go to this special space at the conscious state that would be very low dimensional. Um, and it's in that level of representation that we, we humans do things like planning and imagination, right? Uh, the way that we project ourselves in the future or the past, to try to explain the past, isn't in the space of pixels, and it isn't in the, in the high level space where all of the variables that could potentially be relevant are uh, activated or uh, at, in our mind, we only focus on a few variables at a time. When when I when I play chess or go or when I think about the path to home, I only go through very few steps, and each of these steps sort of ignores almost everything but reality except a few elements that matter to my plan. So so I think we should. And, 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 and now, for this to work, I need to have these representations which select subsets of variables which sort of go together and want to say something about the world, about things that will happen, given things that have happened, and things like that. Um, yeah, let me, uh, let me just skip to things that I think should be done, following up on what I've told you about. This is a long list. Um, okay, so up to now we look at the but really I think we use this for learning how to modularize deep nets in more general ways. Um, another application of this is exploration in reinforcement planning, or agent which is trying to figure out a, a world model. Um, so um, part of that is where to go when you want to explore. What are the interesting things that an agent could do in order to learn more about the world? If I have a probabilistic model about different causal hypotheses, and maybe there's you know some variables over which I have a lot of uncertainty, which is cause and which is effect, well, well, maybe that's a good place to experiment. I, I would like to test whether A is a cause or B is a cause. And it's really easy. Like if I intervene on one, I can the change to the other if it doesn't, it means that it wasn't the cause, right? And vice versa. So, um, so this is very, very useful information. The information that I'm proposing to build with these high level variables is very useful information for an exploration of it. Um, uh, we've been working with you know joint distribution between two or three or whatever n variables, but the real case of interest. Um, as you were pointing out earlier, is uh, things like agents in some situation where things change, uh, where you know it wouldn't be like a totally scenario, but it would be actually maybe we are not there yet. Um, there, are, there are algorithmic issues. So I haven't talked a lot about how we can do those gradients with respect to the meta learning objective, but. As usual with meta learning, it comes with uh, all kinds of overheads. So either you have continuous variables, like the encoder is continuous, so we can backdrop through the updates. As usual in, in like uh, MAML and other meta learning methods, but I don't like it for some reason. Like it's very weird to me. Uh, I don't think brains do that. Um, so in any case, it's also computationally expensive, memory expensive, because you have to remember all of the updates. So it'd be nice to find more efficient way of doing that. And then, of course, there are discrete variables like the graph structure. And we have this estimator, but it's like a reinforced estimator. It's, it has really high noise. So I think there's good research to be done on can we build better estimators for gradients or updates uh, with respect to these objectives? 
Um, there's, I think, a lot of interesting theory to do well you know, beyond what we did to uh, justify this approach, to generalize it, to understand it better. Um, and up to now, we've considered a very simple scenario where, well, you train and then you have uh, one new distribution and I repeat this many times, or maybe, maybe we have a sequence, uh, a bunch of nicely segmented episodes, but in the real world, nobody tells you, okay, now there's a new distribution, okay, there's a new one, no, you just, you know, have a stream online of things. Um, I think the same ideas would work in an online, completely online, really setting, but that needs to be uh, worked on. Um, and then uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that it would be really useful to do inference in that graph, in particular about the interventions themselves. And that would change the game. I think there's a potential for even more reduction in sample complexity once the agent starts to reason about the interventions. So uh, this would be particularly really useful for uh, catastrophic forgetting. So in catastrophic forgetting, the scenario is uh, the learner sees distribution A, then B, then C, and then again A. But if the learner keeps track of uh, not just that there is a change, but I'm going to label the first part as A and the second part as B, and the third part as C, when I get to see examples that are A like, recognize them as A, and then I can remember the kind of distribution I had for A, and I can uh, adapt much faster. In fact, maybe I don't need any adaptation as such, I just need to do inference. In other words, the examples, after I've seen enough things in the world, I don't need to learn anymore, I just figure out what, who did what, right? That's what our brain does all the time, who did what. And then you don't actually need to learn something inference about how Okay, so all of that inference stuff, I think, is a uh, nice continuation. Um, so, so there are a bunch of people working on these ideas uh, at Mila right now. Um, the uh, uh, first part of the list, up to Chris, um, uh, contributed to the submission that we uh, made. Um, and uh, Remy and Simon have a theory that I haven't, I haven't talked about yet. So thank you very much. More questions. Uh, we talked about uh, how much modular design is going to be done with each other. So, how much of time is checking out the number of Yes. Um, so, I was wondering how to talk about so dropout is interesting because it allows us to simulate some of our uncertainty about which is not going to be The longer uh, graphs we play with, it's actually a very useful thing to think of as dropout to level the graph. Yeah. So my question is actually what we don't 